My name is Przemysław Gastold, and I'm both humbled and greatly honored to chair this uh, second panel of this great uh, conference. Uh, we'll delve into the Polish-American relations starting from the mid-70s until the late 80s. We've got three distinguished scholars, specialists in the field of Polish-American relations, and let me just briefly say how we'll manage the panel. I will introduce uh, each of the panelists, then we'll hear their talks, and after that we'll have the Q&A session. And I also encourage you to prepare the questions to our previous panelists, uh, so we'll have more time for discussion. So let's start with Professor Jakub Tyszkiewicz. He's a historian at the University of Wrocław. His research interests focus on contemporary history especially Silesian history and Polish-American relations. His book, Crushing the Monolith, U.S. Policy Towards Poland, 4588, relied on extensive research in declassified American and Polish archives and was recognized in 2016 as the best historical book in Poland. But last year, a couple of months ago, actually, Professor Tyszkiewicz uh, published uh, uh, his new book uh, in English in Rutledge, uh, entitled The Open Window into the Soviet Bloc, U.S. Policy Toward Poland, 56, 80, 68. And today, Professor Tyszkiewicz uh, will deliver a speech about American policy towards Poland in the second half of the 70s and during the uh, so-called the Carnival of Freedom, so the 16 months when the Solidarity Trade Union could freely operate from 1980 to until 1990. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you, dziękuję bardzo. Czy mnie słychać, Do you hear me well? Uh, if I hold this microphone like that, is it okay? Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the organizer for having me and for inviting me to this very interesting panel. I'm very happy that I could hear uh, excellent uh, insights uh, by people who, who, who created history in the 1980s, I'm very happy that uh, I can be here with my colleagues, researchers, academics uh, who focus on Polish-American relations, and I'm very happy that we have guests from Texas, uh, because uh, from that state, uh, four presidents of uh, American presidents uh, originated uh, who were very strongly focused on uh, po uh, po uh, po Poland and uh, relations with uh, Poland, starting with Eisenhower who started uh, uh, the um, contacts uh, with Poland starting in 1956 uh, uh, and who started a long-term relationship uh, with Poland and even the process leading to Poland's independence. And I want to emphasize it because this policy will be continued until 1989 and uh, the Bush's uh, acti activities and measures by his uh, administration administration uh, will be a continuation of Eisenhower's policy, uh, because uh, if we are, uh, ma mention uh, President Lyndon Johnson, uh, who also came from Texas uh, and uh, who, who, who made best efforts uh, uh, to, to, to build bridges uh, towards Eastern Europe, uh, 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 unfortunately unsuccessfully because of the Vietnam War, and Poland had a key role there. And last but not least, uh, both uh, President uh, Bush, uh, President uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush Sr., and uh, so his contribution in the 80s uh, when he served as vice president under Ronald Reagan, about which probably my colleagues will talk more, and President uh, George W. Bush uh, Jr., uh, during whose presidency Polish-American relationships went, uh, entered a new era. Uh, 
uh, which was unprecedented in the 20th century. As a result, I would like to start my presentation with reminding you uh, how uh, American policy looked like uh, shortly before the crisis in Poland of 1980, because you cannot look at the crisis uh, 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 in the years 1980-81 and the activity of solidarity uh, without the background of American policy because it has had its consequences uh, for the uh, uh, pres uh, on the President Carter at the end of his tenure and at the beginning of the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Uh, so we need to remember that in 1970s, uh, the relationship between the two countries uh, uh, went into uh, in a new phase. This was the period of the towns. Uh, so uh, better relationship between uh, the East and the West, uh, and due to the fact that Poland, uh, uh, under um, Edward Gierek, the new secretary of the Communist Party at that time, also opened up to the West. And this has resulted in the uh, revival of uh, Polish-American relations. And Poland, after a short um, period of hesitance uh, during the times of uh, Nixon administration, uh, became uh, the focus of interest of American policy and uh, was a top priority uh, uh, as far as uh, Eastern policy, Eastern European uh, policy is concerned. So it was just the second after Romania, which just showed some symptoms of independence from the, United, uh, from the Soviet Union. So when we look at the whole period of the 1970s, we can see that the admini Carter's administration administration starting from 77 continued this policy and supported contacts with Poland uh, and they argued that this policy is conducive to differentiation uh, in the Eastern Bloc, the idea which was strongly emphasized by the advisor for uh, uh, national security, Zbigniew Przezinski. Uh, let me briefly remind you uh, uh, what was the focus of this policy. So the priority was given to the countries which seemed uh, more most liberal or independent from Kremlin. Obviously, uh, the human rights were uh, distinct issues and were, uh, which were emphasized since the start of uh, Carter's uh, presidency, uh, which also for, uh, had an impact on the policy uh, towards Poland. So we can notice that at that time, uh, the measures taken by Washington focused on four uh, main goals. First of all, the new administration, uh, new Carter's administrations wanted to, uh, uh, to, to increase independence, Warsaw's independence from Kremlin, which was to be made by uh, giving positive response to Polish economic needs. So here I mean uh, economic aid, uh, American uh, aid uh, to Poland, which would contribute to greater independence of Polish authorities towards Kremlin and the Soviet Union. Obviously, the next important element was uh, biggest Poland's orientation towards the West, and here a big role was played by high-level exchanges 
um, and the key role was played by unexpected visit by Carter in Poland in December uh, 87. Uh, uh, we also f uh, and uh, uh, Gierek was to visit uh, Washington the next year. Unfortunately, it didn't came true. And here, an important role uh, was uh, the question of human rights, which can be a bit surprising to us, but uh, the Americans uh, welcomed uh, the activity of Polish uh, opposition and this situation was assessed as a uh, this relationship we considered good as compared to the situation in Czechoslovakia where the re regime was against the Charter 77 and the opposition movement in Czechoslovakia than uh, Gierek's government. Uh, for that reason, um, Washington paid attention to the fact that Gierek did not decide to crush the opposition in Poland. And as one document from 1979 noted, the opposition in Poland is developing without major obstacles. Uh, and therefore, the only um, bigger um, irritant in Polish-American relations was uh, the issue related to uh, reuniting family uh, families. So the communist government in Warsaw uh, rarely consented to uh, for Poles to go to the United States to reunite with their families, and that was the only issue that adversely affected uh, the bilateral relations between Poland and the U.S. And here we could say that the Carter administration essentially didn't see any dangers related to the Poland's economic crisis. We know that at this time the Polish economy was um, in catastrophic condition, uh, was headed towards catastrophe, but it didn't really raise alarms in Washington. Um, in fact, Poland still continued to be supported with loans in the late 1970s, and these loans were, in fact, um, expanded uh, in hopes that Poland would play an independent role. And even in early 1980, after a major deterioration between uh, of relations between East and West uh, due to the Soviet aggression on Afghanistan, uh, this policy towards Poland was still maintained. In a personal letter to Gerek in May 1980, so three months uh, before the crisis, uh, Carter uh, restated the um, indications uh, from form previous letters about the need uh, to strengthen relations and the desire to maintain a dialogue with Poland and with Eastern Europe in general, uh, despite uh, the growing tensions in the international relations. And therefore, the um, outbreak of strikes in Poland was received with much seriousness in Washington, but also with concern. And there was widespread concern about the what these uh, protests would lead to and how they would impact uh, Poland's financial condition. So here we could say that in Washington the protests were not received with enthusiasm, but rather with uh, the concern that this could threaten um, the stability of Poland-American relations. Nonetheless, from the very beginning of the crisis in Poland, and also during the period from late August and early September, uh, the Americans uh, pondered uh, what to do. Uh, they reflected intensely on uh, what course to take. And one of the most important components here was Fritz Erdmath's um, 
um, Reflections, who was responsible for Eastern Europe at the CIA. And I mentioned him um, because these reflections were passed on to Spigniew Brzezinski. And one can surmise that they impacted the logic followed by Washington under Carter in 1980. So this CIA analyst saw the possibility of attaining uh, the US's long-term goal. So the um, liberalization of Poland leading to changes across the whole Eastern Bloc. And this goal was to be attained through um, encouraging both sides of the conflict in Poland uh, to avoid um, force, the use of force, and also by emphasizing um, American non-interference in their affairs. This wasn't just one's, one man's ideas, as evidenced by the fact that as of September, a special coordination committee was appointed to deal with Polish affairs, consisting of members of the Security Council. And uh, this body was constituted in early September 1980, so just after the signing of the August Accords. And very quickly, by September 8th, uh, this body um, stated that the basic aim of the United States is to seek all possible measures to consolidate Polish achievements on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, to keep uh, the USSR from uh, taking action to crush, um, to strangle the changes, um, stifle the changes occur occurring in Poland. So there was an optimistic assumption that the longer these changes in Poland uh, are maintained, uh, the, the lesser the uh, chances of, um, of Soviet intervention. And therefore, the United States was supposed to take any steps that would uh, move forward those um, liberalization processes after August, including first and foremost um, striving to strengthen the Polish economy. So by this they understood further loans to alleviate um, the harsh economic reality or to allow Polish ships uh, to fish in American waters, restructuring um, the, the Polish debt, as well as returning to loans uh, which Poles could repay uh, in Zlotys, so the public loans uh, for 80 that were uh, granted to Poland under Eisenhower and Kennedy. So as a consequence, uh, President Carter decided to grant another loan in the amount of $660 million, about $2 billion in today's money, so $100 million more than had been uh, initially assumed. So, as a Tim Deal uh, stated, um, the U.S. could gain a lot at a little cost in Poland if they play the game right. Here, an important role was also played by the issue of um, Soviet intervention. I am referring to the famous appeal issued by President Carter to the USSR and the dissemination of information uh, saying that the USSR was ready to intervene in December 1980. At the same time, it needs to be said that the Carter administration 
largely assumed that they would keep providing aid to Poland, chiefly economic aid. However, uh, the, the, the loss of the elections meant, Carter's loss of the elections meant that these plans could not be implemented. Um, the Reagan administration, interestingly, at the beginning, essentially continued Carter's policy. At least um, we see this based on um, available documents. There's nothing to indicate that they changed course or they, that, that they had um, a different rationale with regard to Poland. However, we need to remember that this was one of the chief components of American policy at that point. Uh, so the most important aim was to keep deterring the USSR uh, from using force and, and intervening in Poland. And this was done using all possible channels as well as through consultations with allies. So it was argued uh, to the Kremlin that the U.S. is not interfering in Polish affairs and it was emphasized, and this was um, oh, this would be a light motif in later policy. It was emphasized that Poles themselves have to solve their own problems. It was also emphasized to the Kremlin that um, an intervention in Poland would uh, alter the international situation, and the U.S. would be forced to take appropriate measures should should that come to pass. So Polish affairs. Were, were important. This is evidenced in the first letter to Gromyka from January or February 1981. It was emphasized that, uh, in fact, the Polish issue was the second aside from the hostage crisis in Iran. Um, however, a greater interest in Poland and the situation in Poland in U.S. policy only appears in the fall of 1981. Here we have a reformulation of the, the attitude to the crisis in Poland. And there is an important memo by the Secretary of State and um, Secretary of um, the Treasury who jointly agreed that communist Poland had entered a critical phase of developing a pluralistic society and therefore also securing human rights. And therefore, uh, the victory of the reform camp in Poland was supposed to bring a political liberalization to all of Eastern Europe, to make that liberalization possible and to weaken the influence of the Kremlin and the, and the Warsaw Pact. And so this memo emphasized that the state of the Polish economy was deteriorating and that was the biggest threat to um, expanding the space of social freedom in Poland and led to de uh, destabilization and thus increasing the likelihood of um, an intervention uh, from the USSR. Therefore, in the well-conceived interest of the states and the West, um, it would be necessary to continue delivering a large-scale financial aid to Poland, and therefore that is in line with the interests of the West. By the same token, consolidating the gains of August 1980 would lead to a strategic and moral change in the, uh, in the struggle against the USSR and would lead to the, the victory of the West and Western values. And this memo is very important because in December, just before martial law was introduced in Poland, in Reagan's immediate circle, plus the Security Council also uh, considered uh, the plan, a plan to Im increase um, financial aid to Poland, not just from the states, but also um, from Western Europe. 
Of course, this never um, went beyond the project or design phase. So this issue of increasing funding for Poland, given the U.S.'s uh, difficult financial situation, um, the, so this, this plan was discussed. However, it seems that by the end of 1981, a conviction matured about the need to create a sort of mini Marshall Plan for Poland, as I call it, and that would make it possible to maintain um, in Poland a policy to have to, to, to liberalize. Of course, martial law, December 13th, 1981, put an end uh, to these speculations, uh, to these considerations. The U.S. Uh, shifted uh, to a new gear, adopted a new policy. However, it can be said that by the same token, the martial law uh, disrupted or interrupted measures that could have uh, brought significant financial aid to Poland and uh, which could have helped Poland get out of the crisis before 1989. Of course, we need to consider the fact that during this time, it wouldn't have been possible anyway. However, martial law should also be remembered, not just because it crushed uh, the, the grassroots movement in Poland and solidarity, but also uh, it should be remembered from the standpoint of affecting Polish-American relations, uh, which almost came to an end. Uh, thank you very much for showing us this economic and political premises which uh, shaped the U.S. policy towards Poland uh, in late 70s and early 80s. And now we will uh, dive deep into the martial law. So this time for where Professor Tyszkiewicz ended his, uh, uh, his speech. And uh, I will introduce now our second speaker, Professor Patrick Plescott. He's a historian, political scientist, professor at the University of Rzeszów, and head of the Historical Research Office of the IPN branch in Warsaw. He is author of about uh, 200 articles and chapters, and he co-authored or co-edited almost 50, 50 books. Uh, his recent publications uh, include American Style Carnival, U.S. Diplomatic Facilities in the Polish People's Republic on the events between August 1980 and December 1981, and the two-volume book Rurash Spasowski, Parallel Lives Around the Escapes of Polish Ambassadors in December 1981, which were published last year. Today, Professor Plescott will deliver a speech about U.S. policy towards the martial law in the Polish People's Republic. The floor is yours. Thank you. Bardzo dziękuję. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, read, uh, uh, I write a lot. I read not so much, so, so the balance is uh, maintained. I will start with a controversial statement. Professor Tyszkiewicz said that Carnival was, uh, was approved with uh, certain uh, hesitance, and after the Carnival, you have uh, the period uh, of fasting. Uh, so now I would like uh, to, to explain. Uh, so I will try uh, to, to. So I will try to speak slowly because of uh, the interpreting. So I will try to to to, to present my uh, speech in three parts uh, to present three reactions to, to the martial law. 
Yeah. So first of all, uh, internal policy, and I will not talk about it, and then I will focus on foreign policy, American, and then to, to discuss the propaganda aspect. But let me start with a statement that the introduction of a martial law on the 13th of, 13th of December must have been come as a surprise uh, to, to Washington, uh, however, not, not so much because some uh, uh, analysis have shown that it may happen, but uh, it was uh, very difficult. Martial law is not a, uh, uh, not a term used in the Anglo-Saxon war, so, uh, world, so it was really difficult to, to, to understand the term even uh, and to understand what happened uh, on the night. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it took uh, several hours to, to, to digest what has happened and the uh, relief uh, came from the fact that uh, it was concluded that there was no uh, Soviet intervention at that time. So, uh, uh, so this was a site of, re of release uh, and uh, first reactions were quite uh, cautious, including that of President Reagan. And with time, which is quite na natural in foreign policy, uh, or even in Needed. So, um, uh, Ronald uh, Reagan uh, was uh, under, uh, was impressed by, by this crisis, but uh, it must uh, have been uh, food for thought. Uh, so, uh, it was nothing uh, unusual, uh, it, it was even required. So, on the 16th or 17th of December, especially after the meeting of National Security Council of the 17th of December, the White House and Reagan's administration uh, uh, here I will not talk uh, about the, 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 the clashes within uh, the White House. Uh, the narrative has been built, which was more decisive uh, uh, as compared uh, to the narrative shared by the majority of American allies, especially in the West of Europe, but we must remember that Trudeau also was governing in, in France. So we can see a narrative which very strongly attacks or criticizes the martial law as a war Third, uh, by uh, uh, the military on its own uh, nation, and the Soviet uh, theme is not abandoned because uh, the Soviets uh, have been uh, blamed for what has happened in Poland after the 13th of December. And it seems that on the first level, uh, on which I will not, to which I, I will not dwell, this narrative uh, seemed very convincing, and uh, not only uh, to Polish minority uh, in uh, the U.S., but also the uh, public opinion in the U.S., which is to certain contrast to, the, to, to Margaret Thatcher attitude, who supported solidarity by uh, she, she was uh, blamed for her hypocrisy because she fought trade unions in the UK. Uh, but as far as condemning the martial law in Poland, uh, unexpectedly, uh, uh, they needed to coincide water and fire because both trade union and uh, Ronald Reagan uh, were on the same page. Uh, so I believe Reagan uh, uh, managed to, to avoid uh, this uh, hypocrisy. And I believe the narrative adopted by uh, Ronald Reagan was one of the light motives for his presidency as such, obviously not the most important ones. 
jeśli chodzi o politykę zagraniczną. As for the foreign policy, jak już mówiłem, autentyczne przejęcie się sprawą polską so, uh, nie przeczy chęci jej polity- politycznego Poland, wykorzystania uh, i w administracji Reagana pojawił się pomysł, by wykorzystać uh, was used um, sytuację by, w Polsce do uh, Reagan's administration to put more pressure NATO, on NATO, NATO allies uh, 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 in order to discipline them. Jest kryzys, jest problem, uh, we have a crisis, we need to tackle Uh, a problem started in Afghanistan and Poland etapem, is the second stage, so we need to come together under the Mar- American leadership. This is why there was an effort to convince the Allies uh, to uh, take a common stand towards the regime of Jaruzelski, which was to be suggested by the Americans. So On the 23rd of December 1981, when during uh, the Christmas Eve speech, uh, Reagan uh, spoke broadly about Poland and announced uh, a package of economic sanctions imposed uh, on Jaruzelski's regime. Poza tym, pięć dni później, five days later, 9 grudnia, on the 29th of December, ogłoszono drugi, drugi garnitur sankcji. The second package of sanctions was announced, which was directed at the Soviet Union, which was considered responsible for the martial law, indirectly, but still. But apparently the Western Europe didn't want to follow the American example and the specific sanctions I'm not going to mention in detail were not duplicated by the Western Europe. What is more, On the 17th of December 1981, French and German companies signed uh, another uh, package of agreements with the Soviet Union uh, concerning the oil uh, pipeline. So this business as usual has appeared, despite the narrative suggested by uh, the US uh, on the forum of NATO. So we can say that the idea to, 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 to discipline uh, uh, NATO members around uh, the military law in Poland uh, did not prove successful. But we shouldn't exaggerate. We need to remember that the Western world had certain general uh, uh, approach uh, to uh, the situation in Poland because all NATO members agreed Uh, about uh, three uh, requirements uh, towards the Jaruzelski regime. So first of all, uh, coming back to the negotiations with the opposition, a release from prison of uh, political pre- uh, prisoners and um, um, Uh, removing the martial law. Uh, so this was just general, uh, these were general requirements. Uh, and as a result, we have had a diplomatic uh, boycott uh, of Poland, which not everybody observed because Germany and Greece uh, did not follow it. But still, there was some kind of uh, uh, diplomatic demarche and uh, Uh, economic uh, negotiations have been frozen and no more loans were offered to Poland. So there was not so much um, discord be- be- between American and European policy, but still uh, Americans wanted to do more. Uh, and uh, f- last but not least, the propaganda aspect. And here I believe the success is most visible because pr- this is what propaganda is for. Tak więc, uh, so, był taki projekt już there was a project started before uh, the, uh, uh, insti- uh, the martial law, the Charles truth Sauta project uh, developed by Charles Week and American uh, Information Agency, uh, which uh, was uh, the reaction uh, towards the invasion uh, of Afghanistan, and later it was uh, developed uh, 
uh, and it increased the number of uh, hours of a radio free Europe broadcast to mention a few. Uh, and one more important thing, the propaganda uh, um, in neutral uh, meaning of this word uh, was emphasized by two unexpected events of uh, 22nd uh, of December. Uh, I'm sorry, on the 19th of December, 1981, uh, which was Saturday, Ambassador of Polish People's Republic uh, to U.S., Romuald Spasowski, uh, applied uh, for as, uh, asylum uh, in the U.S., and the same uh, request was was made by Polish ambassador to Japan, Zdzisław Rurasz. So this was just a boost, an unexpected gift that could be used uh, from the point of view of information and propaganda. And already on the 22nd uh, December, before the announcement of sanctions, uh, 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 Spasowski was invited to the White House. So this was a big uh, media hype. And uh, the following day, Today, uh, uh, Ambassador Ruras uh, was heard by Human Rights Committee in Congress, uh, and they both were saying that uh, Jaruzelski waged uh, the war against the Polish nation, that they couldn't live anymore in this country, that the escape is a protest against the situation in Poland. He talked about uh, not observe, uh, lack of the observance of human rights. And the most visible, even today, um, uh, which can be seen on YouTube, was a program uh, uh, let Poland Be Poland, uh, TV series, which was broadcast uh, by uh, American Information Agency, uh, and it was broadcast at uh, during the days of solidarity with solidarity on the weekend of the 30th and 31st of January 1982. Uh, it was broadcast across the world. It is a 90-minute documentary. Uh, devoted to solidarity, to Polish people, and which criticized um, the martial law in Poland. So uh, all major uh, uh, politicians from the West uh, featured uh, in this documentary. Uh, so this was a big propaganda success, uh, maybe not such a big success like the political or economic ones. Uh, along the politicians, uh, major uh, pop culture uh, stars uh, featured, including Frank Sinatra, who, who sang a song of 1940s, uh, which, which he sang in Polish. Uh, and uh, uh, the two ambassadors uh, fugitive ambassadors also featured on uh, this documentary. Uh, so there are certain assessments of, of, the, of the quality and the success of uh, this program. Uh, so the very fact that it was uh, uh, it was broadcast uh, across the world. Obviously, it was not broadcast in Poland, but still, some people remember it. Some opposition leaders remember it. Uh, so, so even Poles realized that such such a program was recorded. Uh, so the American attitude after December 13th, uh, which was relatively, um, which was quite opposed to martial law, um, with sanctions and a diplomatic boycott and uh, stopping aid to Poland aside from humanitarian aid, this attitude remained in its main lines until 1989 with some transitional stages that I won't go into. And here, um, concluding, uh, 
because I don't want to take um, the topic away from Professor Domber. One word about 1989 and the bridges, the bridge. On the first panel, uh, Professor Hutchins said that sometimes Americans are accused of passivity in 89, that they could have pushed more. Uh, here, uh, Professor Domber even came up with the term a reluctant inhibitor to describe um, the policy in 1989. However, it can easily be explained. After a martial law, the Americans employed a technique that I call financial blackmail. So, okay, we'll go back to negotiations, we'll go back to the table uh, talking about loans and financing. However, you need to democratize. So in 1989, this uh, simply started to uh, to happen, that, that there was no need to push. It could have been risky. Uh, the democracy, uh, democracy started happening, and things were going in the direction that uh, the Americans wanted. So they saw it as a po positive process. So why push? Why intervene? Uh, that, that's a generalization, of course. Um, I would only claim that in its main lines the American strategy adopted after December 13th survived uh, for the next decade almost until uh, the um, actual political transformation in Poland. That's all from me. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Gregory Domber from California Polytechnic. He's a scholar of international history and US, uh, US East European relations. He published a book entitled Empowering Revolution, America, Poland, and the End of the Cold War. He is also the author of numerous articles, chapters on US-Polish relations. His current project utilizes digital humanities techniques to better understand the influences of American exchange programs from the 50s to the 80s on Poland's negotiated revolution in 1989. Professor Domber today will uh, deliver a speech about George W. Bush and US-Polish relations in the second half of the 1980s. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, all of the collaborators who made this who made this uh, meeting possible. It's really great to be back in Warsaw and to be part of a meeting like this to mark this really important day that, that is often overlooked in the uh, in the American media, unfortunately. And so it's good to be here and, and to mark this. Um, in this talk, I'm going to make remarks about the second half of the 1980s, from 1984 to about uh, the creation of the Mazowiecki government in August of, of 1989. And in terms of American policy in the second half of the 80s, it really had four main focuses. The first was incentivizing the PZPR to free political prisoners to pursue political liberalization and hopefully legalize solidarity, right? That's what the US government wanted for a long time and pushed for throughout the period. The second key part of American policy is using diplomatic visits, including Vice President Bush's visit in 1987, uh, to support the solidarity opposition movement, while at the same time building trust with, um, with the reform-minded PZPR leaders. And third part is providing material and monetary support to solidarity through, to the opposition through both the National Endowment for Democracy and, and the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. And then the fourth major topic I want to talk about today is managing the revolutionary changes of 1989 uh, to ensure stable change and to make sure that the possibilities of a backlash were, were minimized both internally and externally. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is, is really consistent with what both Professors Hutchings and Simons brought up. Um, there is, uh, I think, a growing consensus on, on this role and this, this policy. So on that first part, when Reagan when Reagan declares sanctions in December of 1981, it has, it, from the beginning, those sanctions are revocable. They can be uh, lifted, right? And so there's this question of just how to do that and when to do it. The, the broad definition of what the United States wanted from the beginning was an end to martial law, the freeing of political prisoners, right, because thousands of solidarity uh, activists had been put in jail, 
and then either pursuing negotiations with the representatives of the people or legalizing solidarity. The, the third one sort of shifted from time to time. Um, in the midst of martial law, the Reagan administration creates this policy called the step-by-step -step policy, krok po krok, uh, in Polish, to lift sanctions basically when the PCPR took necessary steps towards political or economic liberalization. And the Poles had actually proposed this first, and the White House signed on to it by May of 1983. And this is sort of in addition to the long-term policy of differentiation that you mentioned uh, going back to the 1950s of rewarding Poland when it moved away from the Soviet Union in terms of its foreign affairs. Um, events in 1983, sorry, moving away from the Soviet Union in its foreign affairs. Um, events in 1983, including the successful and peaceful papal visit, the end of martial law, and a partial amnesty was cause for the U.S. to really begin re-evaluating and rethinking its sanction policy and begin to follow through with the step-by-step -step approach. Western allies, European allies, were, were already threatening to reschedule uh, a lot of Poland's debt, and so at that point, the U.S. took the first step of allowing those rescheduling talks through the Paris Club to go, to go forward. Um, building on this modest success of the step-by-step -step policy, um, American diplomats, John Davis, um, uh, Lawrence Eagleberger, then began a really quiet process of negotiating the release of 11 key opposition leaders who were tr facing trial for treason in 1984. So through these negotiations, uh, the group which included uh, Jacek Koran, Adam Miknik, Zbigniew Romaszewski, Henrik Wujec, Andrzej Gwiazda, and Jan Rulewski, they were released uh, without a trial, um, or after one day of a trial. And in return for this, in a, in a pre-existing agreement, the U.S. allowed Lot to return to run some flights to the United States again, flights that had been blocked since December of 1981, and Poles were again given access to American waters for, for fishing. Um, when some of those freed prisoners, however, were put back in jail in 1985, whatever trust had been built kind of fell apart. Um, and so the step-by-step -step policy remained in place, um, but in 85, there was a real low point in U.S.-Polish relations. Things get better in the end of 1986 when the PCPR, for domestic reasons and because of pressure from uh, Western Europe in particular, um, decide on a final amnesty for political prisoners, um, releasing all political prisoners, and they're not sent back uh, to jail afterwards. Um, Although this is an important step toward liberalization, it was not caused by American policy per se, but it still part sparked an important shift, a shift that, that Tom Simons talked about. After November 1986, there was a concerted effort to work through existing sanctions and try to normalize relations now that Poland was following more of what the United States wanted to see. And this is where all of these visits in the late 1980s really come into importance. Um, with the PCPR having fulfilled two key American goals of ending martial law and releasing all political prisoners, the two sides begin a lot of diplomatic exchanges that were meant to build trust over those earlier ruptures. Uh, so the, the, the advance team is led by Tom Simons in December of 1986, kind of taking a survey of Eastern Europe. After that comes uh, John Whitehead in that January 1987 visit, which is really essential um, to changing the relationship and changing the conversation within the United States on how to react to what's happening in Poland. So Whitehead comes, he visits Warsaw, and he meets with numerous government officials, including Jaruzelski, sort of lays down what the American position will be and, and how to improve relations. Um, but these visits by Americans were not only with government contacts. John Whitehead also met with Lech Wałęsa and was told in no certain words by Wałęsa and his advisors that they supported the end of sanctions including reinstating most favored nation status and ending prohibitions on new loans uh, and new credits. So solidarity was also clear in 1987 that they wanted the U.S. to improve economic relations with Poland. As the aid memoir that was given from Valencia directly to Whitehead stated, uh, quoting here, each step on the road to, to democratizing public life in Poland should be answered by concrete activities in the area of economic aid. Right? And this unofficial dinner hosted at the ambassador's residence was part of a much longer pattern. And I think the one person who's really missing from this meeting is, is John Davis, right? He was an essential part of all of this. His name needs to be mentioned with every policy, every discussion. <coughs> 
When he came to Poland in, as Charge of Affairs, he and his wife Helen decided to have parties at the, at the ambassador's residence down the street from Puławska. Um, and over time, they brought friends first, but more solidarity individuals kept showing up. And informally, every month, every time a congressional visit came, these solidarity leaders would meet at the, at the ambassador's residence and discuss among themselves and discuss with the visitors their views on policy. And it was this way that the US could understand what solidarity wanted, what the advisors wanted. Um, and it became, in today's parlance, kind of a safe space for the opposition and a really central part of, of where relations happened. Um, this pattern of, of holding meetings with the PZPR and Polish government officials followed by an unofficial dinner with solidarity at the ambassador's residence became a way to pursue kind of a two-track policy of rebuilding relations with the government while continually hearing from and coordinating policy with the political opposition. And so armed with this note from Buenza, which is sort of like an important statement. You know, if Wences says this is what we want, congressional leaders, uh, White House leaders have to respond. And so it really is helpful, I think, in lifting final sanctions, something that, that happens in February of 1987. And so step by step comes to an end, and the question is now, how are we going to reward Poland when it does take further steps towards liberalization? Um, so when Vice President George H.W. Bush travels to Warsaw in September of 1987, he became the highest ranking American official to be there since Carter's visit 10 years earlier. Um, as was the pattern established by Whitehead, uh, he met with government officials and, and at a dinner at the ambassador's residence with Valenza and other opposition leaders. The visit is probably most important for its symbolic um, statements and the excitement created when Valenza unexpectedly joined Bush on a visit to the Stanisław Kostka church um, to lay a wreath at the grave of Father Jerzy Papoyusko. Um, the, the images of them waving the triumphant uh, Solidarity V and standing in front of enduring crowd was really a powerful symbol of America's support for Solidarity, for Valencia in particular. Adam Micknick remembered it this way, saying, um, Bush clearly signaled support for the Democratic opposition. The Vice President's visit here to Warsaw and his meeting with the people were something else, courageous and meaningful symbolic gestures. It was a turning point, unusually significant for later events. In his private meetings, Bush also made important statements about future American commitments to Poland, something that you mentioned that were really useful in 1989. He, in talking to Jaruzelski, explained that the US wanted, quote, institutionalized pluralism, meaning reforming the electoral system to make it possible to present independent opinions, reforming the trade union law uh, to make it possible to register independent trade unions again. As he explained at another point in uh, talks with the PCPR, he said, it would make it easier for the administration to make a commitment, right? That if these liberalizations happen, that's up to you, but if you do it, it'll make it easier for us to, to reward you in some kind of way, right? What the rewards are are always left unclear. So the limitations that have been put on economic and political relations by sanctions were gone by that visit in 87, and this is a big, a big but, but the US had not clarified just what rewards would be there, and that's, a, I think, a point of contention. Um, okay, third point. While all of this is going on, the United States is also uh, monetarily um, and materially supporting the opposition. Um, shortly after the declaration of, of martial law, non-governmental organizations, particularly the, the Committee in Support of Solidarity, run by Irene Lasota, begin sending cash, things like radios, um, even some uh, falsified papers. They're supported primarily by the AFL-CIO. Um, and then beginning in 1984, with the creation of the National Endowment for Democracy, there are significant amounts of US congressional money that began to find their way into pipelines that had been created. This money it has an interesting pattern. It starts in Congress, but then it's given to second parties in the United States. The AFL-CIO's Free Trade Union Institute the Committee in Support of Solidarity gets a lot of it. Polish American Congress gets a lot of it. And then these American groups then give it to uh, a network of Polish emigres. So the AFL-CIO gives $300,000 a year to the Solidarity Coordinating Office Abroad in Brussels. Um, the CSS gives a lot of money to different publishing groups, uh, providing, again, radios and other support that way. Polish American Congress ran a smaller number of grants uh, directly to political prisoners to publishing work outside of Poland by groups like Annex and to the Independent Polish Agency in Lund, Sweden. Um, 
What is interesting to me about this transnational network is that it's almost exclusively run by emigre Poles. And so the money is American, but once the money was out of Washington, it was out of American hands, and American influence was really greatly limited in that way. There's very little accounting of where it went and how it was used. There was a lot of trust in this network, um, but there was not much leverage for American leadership here in terms of specific decisions. And so it was a, uh, an important amount of money, somewhere around $10 million from 1984 to 1989, made its way to the Polish opposition from the US Congress. Um, concurrent with this, the CIA also had their own program. We know much less about this. It has not been fully declassified in any way. Perhaps uh, Hutchings, who was in Munich, can speak to some of this. That's where I understand some of it was based. Um, the details and the documentation are, are a bit um, open at this point. Initially, the CIA recognized that the AFL-CIO and the CSS, uh, Irena Lasota's group, were doing enough. Um, and so they get involved a bit later, uh, I think beginning in 1983. They help Radio Solidarity hack into Polish TV. They unfurl a Solidarity banner at a soccer match. They printed up thousands of postcards of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact to sort of show Soviet-Polish uh, collaboration er earlier. John Davis referred to these as morale boosters, and they were important. The CIA also began smuggling money, uh, printing presses, technology perhaps as well. Uh, somewhere around $10 million were connected to this program called QR Helpful, as is the, is the term that's been opened now. Um, I don't know, I, you're shaking your head, so I'd love to hear your comments on so this. Small. So small, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was the same amount that made it in, in secret but not covert means. Um, and again, the, the recipients of this money did not on purpose know it was coming from the CIA, right? So again, the American leverage, American leadership is limited um, in terms of how the money is used. Last part, I want to talk about the events of 1989. So no new U.S. policy really comes out in 1988. There's lots of changes happening in Poland. Uh, it's an election year, right? Bush is running for election. Uh, but after being inaugurated in January of 1989, now President Bush was faced with a rapidly changing domestic situation in Poland, headed toward the round table negotiations. And I think rather than pursue ad hoc and to buy himself time, right, they start this national security review process um, to, try to, create, uh, to try to create consensus. And as Ambassador Simons mentioned, right, there is this important policy decision to reward officially political liberalization with economic support, something that's deeply unpopular among the CIA, in Treasury, and also in defense, I think, where either you or John Davis referred to a couple of them as sort of like original Reaganites who just wanted to explode the system and not reward any of the communists. Um, there were still powerful pockets of skepticism about what was transpiring in the East. Uh, National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft and Bush himself were concerned and unconvinced perhaps about the sincerity of Gorbachev's reformist push. They were concerned maybe that, about the limits of new thinking on Eastern Europe that might be more propaganda than anything else. Um, state and NSC wanted to link economic rewards to liberalization, but again, the CIA and, and, and Treasury really vehemently worked against this change in doctrine. Treasury concerned that money being sent to Poland might be wasted if meaningful economic reforms were not paired with it or didn't come first. And President Bush himself was sometimes uh, driven by these ideas too. When he spoke with Chancellor Helmut Kohl in, uh, in the summer of 1989, he told Kohl that the United States didn't want to, quote, pay money down a rat hole to Poland. And so that really limited how much the US was willing to send. And something like $10 million um, was, uh, sorry, uh, a paltry amount was, was announced at Hamtramck, uh, much less than the $10 billion that, that solidarity officials were shopping around Washington at that point, both from the government and from the opposition. On the ground, in Warsaw, Ambassador Davis and his team did an absolutely amazing job, right? They were uh, aware of everything that was happening and they wrote back with really great um, analysis of what was happening and a prescience about what was happening. Uh, as the June elections neared, Davis made clear that the PCPR was destined for a deep defeat with solidarity looking like it would win all but two or three Senate seats and all of the same seats it was eligible for. This is about what happened and it's a much higher expectation from Davis than what a lot of public voices were saying, including in the opposition itself at that point. While Davis and the Bush administration were unquestionably in support of the opposition, what Davis called solidarity's coming victory 
um, was not a moment of unbridled joy. Davis worried that too big a victory would saddle solidarity with responsibility, but not give it any real authority in these semi-free elections. And he was really worried that a pro-opposition, as he said, tidal wave or something close to it, will threaten a sharp defensive reaction from the regime. And so the Americans wanted the opposition to, to succeed, but were nervous about the pace and the extent of change precipitating a backlash. And this gets even worse, right, after the June 4th elections, you have the collapse of the nationalist, the, there are public signs that the SD and the ZSL, these partner parties, were going to defect from the PZPR. And so when Bush makes that visit in, in July of, of 1989, he's there to what I think the, the way you put it, uh, Ambassador, uh, Professor Hutchings, right, that the U.S. wanted to support the process. And they saw Yerzelski as an essential part of that process. And so when... When Bush made that visit in July of 1989, he met with Yerzelski and Solidarity figures for luncheon at the ambassador's residence. Yerzelski lived in the neighborhood, not quite across the street, but pretty close to it. And it was the first time he had been invited to the ambassador's residence for one of these parties, right? Um, again, the US support for the opposition and the democratization of Poland was unquestionable, but Bush made a special effort to publicly show he supported Yerzelski and was willing to work with Yerzelski. He felt, quote, Yelzelski's experience was the best hope for a smooth transition. And so where his visit in 1987 was really symbolically important for showing personal support to Valenza, in 1989, he goes to Westerplatte in Gdańsk with Yelzelski in public and lays a wreath down there, right? And this is Bush's symbolic action to show that, that support for Yelzelski um, was important in what the, the U.S. saw in the new government, right, and, and as part of the process. John Davis went as far as when meeting with unnamed solidarity advisors to write down numbers on the back of a, a, a matchbook um, to explain how they could headcount so that when PCPR and SD and ZSL individuals defected from the vote, the fewest number of solidarity members of the parliament could vote for Yaroslavsky to make sure he got in. And that's exactly what happened. The polls might well have been aware of that technique of, of head counting, but, but Davis explained how to go about successfully getting um, Yaroslavsky elected as president to, to maintain that system, to maintain the agreement, and to maintain stability. Bush also used his July 89 visit to announce a few meaningful additions to American aid, most notably support for significant World Bank loans and the creation of a, what turned out to be a very successful $100 million Polish-American enterprise fund that, that, that generated a lot of small enterprises and actually earned money over the years, um, from what I understand, in, in the long term. Um, and this amount was much less than the opposition it had hoped for and much less than Davis and other voices in the State Department has advised. Um, Bush was cautious about what he wanted to do, and there were deep divisions in the executive branch that you both alluded to about just how far the United States could go with incentives. Um, so in conclusion, some, some sort of analytical thoughts. When Mazowiecki was elected prime minister in September of 1989, the United States government was overjoyed, right? I, you heard that in your remarks, totally overjoyed by the success of Poland's democratic breakthrough. It was a fulfillment of five decades of American policy towards Poland. And George H.W. Bush was really at the center of this from the beginning. When martial law was declared, he was the guy who got the call saying martial law has started um, and decided not to wake Reagan out at Camp David, right? Bush took that call. Um, Bush was a notable pragmatist throughout his time as vice president who argued against more hardline voices coming from CIA and defense who wanted to crush Poland and its economy in the 1980s. Like Secretary Schultz, Bush was a successful advocate for pursuing the step-by-step -step policy rather than pushing the regime to collapse. He was one of the voices who supported the Reagan-era goal of pursuing what they called evolutionary change at that point in time in Eastern Europe. And he was a consistent supporter of the Polish opposition, clearly enamored, like Whitehead, like others, by the, the solidarity leadership, right? These were heroes to people like Bush and to Whitehead. Um, but he was cautious at his core. And I think rather than, than push the pace of revolution in 1989, Bush and the US government focused on stabilizing the change that the Poles had agreed to at the round table. Um, and that included, of course, keeping Yaroslavsky and other PCPR leaders in the new government. Um, 
the Bush's administration focus on stability um, and caution, I think, helped to explain the limits of what Timothy Gartnash famously called Poland's revolution, right? It's reform revolution, right? To keep it peaceful, to make sure there wasn't a, a backlash. And so this caution also meant that the economic support that Poland needed, the kind of bailout that Poles really wanted, would have to wait until economic reforms, right? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Bartel is going to talk about this a little bit, I hope, in the, in the later panel. But American policy was an, an unqualified success, not because the United States was determinative of much of anything. The US was successful because from the beginning, from Carter, through Reagan, through Bush, because the administration saw solidarity's potential as a force for transformation. Uh, time and time again, the US did what it could to keep solidarity functional, um, but deferred to solidarity's leadership on the tactics and the strategies polls themselves wanted to pursue. So it's very clear in reporting from 1989 that when the coalition government is, when the SD and the ZSL are breaking away um, and are going to support a Mazowiecki government, the Americans are actually really nervous about this. It's driven by the polls themselves. They're the ones making these strategic decisions. It's not being driven by uh, Americans. Um, they're happy with what happens, but very nervous at the time. So, Almost certainly, American money and material support helped empower more moderate voices in the opposition. Uh, but American leaders, Bush included, had the good sense to have polls and solidarity lead the revolution itself. Uh, June 4th, 1989 was a victory for the United States, but really a triumph that was led by the polls and not the other way around, right? That's, that's when we ask that question of what percentages, right? I always put it as 70% Poland, um, 20% Gorbachev, 10% the United States, and the rest of the West. Um, that's always how I see it. Okay, I'll leave it there. Hopefully there's questions and, and more discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all the panelists for their insightful and interesting uh, perspectives on Polish-American relations. Now we've got more than half an hour for Q&A session, so I... Uh, encourage you to ask questions. You've got microphones on your table. Just put, uh, just touch the white screen and it will turn red, which means the mic is on. So, please. If you don't have questions, I will start with, uh, I will use my privilege as a chair. Uh, oh, there is Professor Dudek. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to ask Professor Dambe uh, uh, relating to the amount of $10 million that has been mentioned time and again in his uh, uh, paper as the amount that U.S. channeled uh, to uh, solidarity and opposition in Poland in 1980s via different channels. So uh, the literature uh, uh, quotes different amounts, sometimes higher than $10 million. So I wanted to ask you, can we verify the scale of a financial aid? So how do you have access to, to the materials of American institutions? Because some of them are still classified. So if you could dwell, delve on it, I would be very grateful. Um. So just to clarify, um, my research focused on archival sources, on actual documents. Uh, I, I am very comfortable with the amount of $10 million being sent through congressionally funded support through the National Endowment for, to, for Democracy and then to Poland. So that $10 million, I have a, a full list of that in the back of my book. I have a, like a, um, a chart on that. Um, that's, that amount is very clear to me. Um, it is taken from uh, different reports back to the NED at the time. It's consistent with information, appropriations and information in Congress itself. This was uh, a secretive program, but a, but a public one. It was open, it was available, you can find information on it. The exact details were kept quiet, but the money amount of $10 million to the NED I think is about right. I don't know how much money the CIA actually sent. There was a book 
written, uh, I think, two or three years ago by uh, a scholar at CSIS, uh, Seth Jones, uh, where he mentions QR Helpful as a name for the first time. Um, in my book, I apparently didn't, I did not think that there was an actual CAA presidential finding to start a program. He says there was. He clearly was able to interview people involved in, in the CIA operation, but we do not have specific or meaningful archival documentation on just how much money it was. And so this is really just an estimate um, of another $10 million. Um, and I really would like to put uh, Ambassador, or sorry, uh, Professor Hutchings on the spot, if you can speak about, um, about what was happening in Munich at the time, because most, my understanding is that that was one of the spaces that the CIA used, not your offices obviously, but one of the spaces where they operated to send money to private groups, to, to shell companies that then made its way to Poland. Um, but the exact amounts, uh, Professor Dudek, I'm, it's unclear. Um, and there are a lot of requests to the CIA. There is a, there's a fruits volume right now on Poland that, um, Mercer Montanu has put together um, that is under declassification review, and I'm hoping that some of the material might be in there, but it's, it's based on interviews I have not conducted and estimates by Pachkowski and others that the CIA sent about $10 million. And I think that's fair that they probably doubled what NED sent, and I don't think it was more than that. Um, I think what's notable is that these private groups run by people like Jakub Karpinski and Arena Lasota are almost as good as the CIA, or as good, if not better, as the CIA uh, at getting this stuff there. And one of the funny anecdotes that I love telling is that um, when the opposition wanted to get high-tech computers, um, I think they were like Commodore 64s. They were for, for, for creating uh, Samistat, right? Nishalezhny uh, publications. Um, they had to go through the AFL-CIO and the CSS because COCOM restrictions meant that, that uh, the CIA couldn't send it. Right, um, but it's still all an estimate on actual how much CIA money there is. I, I, I haven't seen any convincing documentation. Thank you. Are there, are there any questions? Tomek. Professor Dudek, uh, Professor Dudek asked about the 10 million. Uh, let me up the ante and I'll ask about the 10 billion. Uh, you mentioned, and I'm addressing Professor Gregory Domber, you mentioned that this magic number circulated both among the solidarity leaders as well as the leaders of um, communist Poland. And if that's true, Professor Trzeciakowski even adapted adapted the assumptions of one of the economic programs to that amount of American aid. However, do you have any idea why this round sum, where this round sum came from? Who was the first to have said, to have thrown out this number? And then it sort of grew into legend over the years. And my second question, do you have any suspicions as to whom Ambassador Davies instructed uh, regarding techniques of voting in Parliament on the candidature um, of uh, General Jaruzelski? I also have a question for Patrick Plescott, loosely uh, related to the topic of your paper. You have published a volume of sources, materials that the counterintelligence uh, stole from American uh, uh, American missions uh, during uh, martial law. Uh, so we know that these uh, cables ended up on Jaruzelski's desk directly. I think he was the only person that would have an overview of everything. Did it have any impact on his policy? Was it a source that mattered to him uh, in terms of learning about what the Americans were planning and what sort of maneuver, room for maneuver he had? Was it useful to him? And another question, in your assessment, because you mentioned that the, uh, the Reagan sanctions and the new policy after December 13th was aimed against the government in Warsaw and in the Kremlin. 
To what extent did Reagan want to hit the Soviet Union and the and martial law in Poland simply uh, came in at the right time for him to revise his policy? Maybe before both of you answer the questions, let me uh, throw two more out there. I have two questions uh, for Professor Tyszkiewicz uh, regarding Moscow's policy towards Polish-American relations or in the context of American-Polish relations. It was not a secret to Moscow that Washington's, Washington's policy was to increase Poland's independence vis-a-vis -vis the Kremlin and to reorient Poland uh, to the West. So how did the Soviet Union approach these lively relations between Poland and the US in the 70s. And one more question for Patrick, uh, referring also to what Tomek said, because we've spoken at length about the aims of American policy. So what was the aim of Jaruzelski's team after introducing martial law vis-a-vis -vis Washington. So what were, what was Jaruzelski's outlook on American-Polish relations? We know of two attempts to send uh, Adam Schaaf on a mission. We have Department of State documents uh, that survive, talking about Schaaf's talks at the lower rungs of the American ladder. Gregory, I mean, you mentioned about this exchange programs and I think it's very important and sometimes almost not fully exploited within this framework of U.S. soft power or public diplomacy towards Poland. Let me just give you an example of Hieronim Kubiak, who was in 1981 a member of the Politburo. And there was this news weekly, which was called Rzeczywistość, Reality, the flagship newspaper of stubborn, hardline, dogmatic communist, which was published in May 1981, the first issue. And within this issue of uh, 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 Reality Weekly, Kubiak was accused of being CIA agent, an uh, acting member of the Communist Politburo was accused of being active member. And why he was accused? Because in the 60s, he went to the United States uh, as a part of exchange program, probably some State Department program. And the other examples, Piotr Jaroszewicz. In the early 60s, Piotr Jaroszewicz, the high figure within the communist government, went to the United States for one, more than one month. It was a grand leadership project conducted by the State Department, and he didn't, I mean, mention very of frequently in his biography about those visits. And there were more of journalists and also PCP politicians who took part in those exchanges. While they were not, I would say, so keen to talk about it, I'm sure that this kind of personal relationships which were, which were fostered during this, uh, uh, there is these exchanges were very important to understand their perception and their approach towards US policy, which was different in most of the other socialist states. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. So I understand I have an hour and a half to answer now um, without rushing. So very briefly, um, thank you, Tomek, for the question about the counterintelligence documents. This is something that we didn't know about a few years ago because since the mid-1970s until 1990, because that's where the materials stopped, and the uh, Polish communist counterintelligence would steal, would systematically steal um, diplomatic um, letters from the consulate in Warsaw as well as the embassy in Warsaw, the consulate in Poznań and Krakow. Uh, these were not sort of intelligence or spy documents. 
um, były to dokumenty dyplomatyczne, they were ale diplomatic documents. However, most of them were either classified or had restricted access, and they often contained detailed descriptions of the Polish reality, descriptions of meetings with Polish interlocutors. Uh, this is very interesting material that gave Jaruzelski an, um, a, 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 an overview of the situation. And that's how he got his hands on information. Um, it gave him a partial um, insight into what the uh, American diplomats were thinking about the current situation in Poland. It, it went on for several years, over a dozen years. However, can you say that the, this knowledge impacted Jaruzelski's decisions? Well, that's that would be very difficult. I haven't seen any evidence saying say that Jaruzelski read a document stolen from the embassy, translated into Polish, and therefore, incontrovertibly, he took such and such decision. Uh, there is no proof that would establish that. And it was a delicate matter as well, because as always with intelligence materials or counterintelligence materials, sometimes if you make a decision, you will reveal your source. So you need to handle the information very carefully, uh, especially when making decisions based on this secret knowledge. However, we can trace certain steps that were taken by the repressive apparatus, the communist apparatus, with regard to different Poles who contacted the U.S. Embassy, and here we see certain connections. So somebody met with the Americans, they said something, and suddenly they are within uh, the purview of the communist um, services, they are being targeted, they are being surveilled. Uh, so I think it had more impact on the Polish interlocutors who went to the U.S. Embassy rather than um, having an impact on Poland's general policy towards the U.S. It would probably have looked exactly what it looked like without uh, Jaruzelski getting his hands on those um, uh, communications. Moscow as the main target, Poland uh, in instant that was used. Well, what happened was Reagan did uh, use the situation in Poland in order to pin the blame on the Soviets, except um, well, the, the, the policy became more confrontational in Carter's later years. Uh, it's Carter that puts an end to the detente in December 1980. However, in his election campaign, Reagan was not a, a, um, a, a staunch anti-communist more than Carter. If we look at the intelligence uh, analyses of VSB, the, the Polish Security Service, uh, they wrote, maybe Carter would have been better because we know him, but Reagan is okay. Um, he's, wink, um, he's winking at the conservatives. However, he's uh, more of a peacemaker and he's going to try to seek a modus vivendi uh, with Moscow and with Warsaw. So it's not that Reagan uh, sort of flung himself uh, forward with anti-communism in reference to Poland. However, martial law became a key element, a key um, mm, stimulus, and maybe uh, Mr. Tyszkiewicz knows more about the long durée. In December 1981, when coming to power, was Reagan uh, going um, striking Driving for confrontation uh, and a new arms race, because elements of that were already evident under Carter. However, in Reagan's first months, he's more of a peacemaker. He's uh, trying to reduce tension uh, as compared to his later years. Also, Jaruzelski's attitude to the U.S. after December 13th. I'm sorry, I, I apologize for speak, speaking so fast and making um, shortcuts. So I would say the following. At the beginning, Jaruzelski felt strong enough. So at least in the propaganda dimension, he decided to be confrontational. You're criticizing, uh, so you Americans are criticizing martial law, so we will air on TV a series about American spies in Poland, and so on and so forth. Um, that is what we saw in the first months of, of the martial, of martial law, after which TV was blocked. So I would see this as being ideologically confrontational, however, it's interesting 
interesting when you look at the Polish side's diplomatic documents. They are quite warmongering at first, uh, saying, uh, yes, uh, we'll resist the sanctions, we'll keep on pushing uh, with our policies. The uh, martial law is great, uh, we don't need American money. However, as time passes and we read through Ministry of Interior materials, not even the security service materials, uh, there is more and more talk of money. Asking for money, in fact. So the topic of money, um, and they're saying, well, we're desperate, uh, we need this money and we need to reconcile. And at one point, these communications are overruled by uh, the topic of money. We've talked to this bank, we've talk, talked to, the, to this official. Uh, we can unblock the money, we just have to release the prisoners. So the, the reality uh, comes back to haunt them. Uh, the purely economic reality uh, takes precedence and uh, Jaruzalski and his staff need to change tune. So first they're happy uh, to to see uh, the success of uh, martial law, but then it seems reforms are not being successful, the economic situation is desperate, and the economic blackmail that I mentioned proves effective, and the Polish communists and diplomats uh, become, um, start asking for money. Uh, th that was very general. Of course, the question about uh, the USSR and Poland, Moscow's attitude towards um, Poland's policy towards the US, it's hard to answer that question without um, examining Soviet archives. So here I cannot give you a, 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 a detailed answer. However, we must keep in mind that generally speaking, all of Poland's steps towards the U.S. had to have prior approval from the Kremlin, and this didn't change after 1956, nor had it changed in 1987. Secondly, the Americans also saw or took note of any uh, signs of concern in the Kremlin, a concern about Poland drawing near to the states, coming closer to the states. And we see this in one document that emphasized Poland's positive attitude to the US, uh, which stated that the Gerek uh, administration is maintaining contacts with Washington, even though the green light on, on at the Kremlin is starting to blink, uh, is sending a warning. So Washington, that would mean that Washington was well aware of how its relations with Warsaw would impact the Kremlin or would be received at the Kremlin. Um, same in Poland, uh, they would look to the Kremlin uh, before taking any steps. And that had to do with the current condition of the relations between these two superpowers. So if relations improved between Moscow and Washington, relations would improve between Poland and Washington, and the Poles could do more. And Gerek's administration used this to the maximum in the 1970s. Uh, nothing more could be done given the economic situation. So indeed, the Soviet Union also for technological reasons allowed uh, the purchase of American licenses to use uh, technology technologies like color TVs and so on. 1978, we have the American license in Poland or computer parts and so on and so forth. So this opening of Poland to the West in the 1970s was somehow also beneficial to the Kremlin because that's how they got access to technologies that they would not have had. So that's one thing. Secondly, we need to remember about the fact that Poland 
uh, has conducted a foreign policy which was consistent with uh, the Kremlin's policy and throughout the period of Poland's dependency on Moscow uh, has not changed. Uh, so I believe that and one more element, propaganda, official Kremlin uh, propaganda in 1980 and 81 uh, spoke of counter-revolution supported by Western imperialists, mainly the US. So the actual situation was different. Uh, the US uh, was more moderate, however, the elements of threats uh, to pose for conducting to close relations with the US uh, can be seen. And Polish uh, clients of Washington, as they were labeled, strongly uh, emphasized that they would want to, to, to do more, but they could not. So if I may add uh, on, if I could uh, refer to CIA's money to Poland uh, uh, in accordance to one of uh, participants uh, of uh, a conference organized by I uh, Institute for National Remembers, remembers uh, uh, so he was a member of uh, a CIA, uh, uh, so uh, Poland obtained $20 million, uh, so it, it was much less but the money put into Afghanistan. Afghanistan. But we must remember that uh, the money uh, uh, offered by CIA didn't come to Poland directly, but uh, it also was sent to uh, to, to Poles uh, who, uh, who were immigrants across Europe. So. These funds not only uh, were sourced to Poland or to solidarity, we also seem to forget about one more channel, uh, because I can risk saying that another challenge uh, channel was Vatican and the special agreement between uh, Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II, which is not uh, uh, which is not visible in official documents, uh, so this uh, aid uh, didn't have to be uh, easily followed. Uh, so there was a very important question about the documents uh, uh, seized by uh, Polish uh, uh, intelligence, American documents. So these are uh, authentic documents because the originals are in Washington. But we need to remember that based on the documents I have seen, thanks to Patrick's book, Counterintelligence uh, sees the documents concerning uh, the situation in Poland and talks held by the Americans with Polish uh, interlocutors, and I do not think I have seen documents concerning American policy towards Poland, uh, such as opinions by U.S. Embassy or the documents uh, that are available in our archives uh, from Polish desk uh, dating back to 1981 and 87 show, well, I haven't researched them, I have just scanned them, but they clearly show that these analyses were sent uh, via other channels and they couldn't reach Jaruzelski's desk. So I wouldn't overestimate uh, their role uh, to, to policy towards, uh, of, towards Polish policy, but Jaruzelski and his uh, team knew whom, uh, who talks to the Americans in Poland, because in the 1980s there were quite a number of them in Poland, which was also an important element of uh, U.S. policy, because uh, since 1976 and uh, uh, up definitely after 1980, the Americans start uh, to talk to Polish opposition, which in 1980s will, would become a norm, and not only with authorities, as it was the case after.
after 1956. Thank you. May I? Uh, just uh, briefly to refer to to, to these uh, seized uh, notes, uh, I believe uh, uh, this has changed at the end of 1980s because I have seen the set, the collection from from late 1980s. Uh, I'm not well familiar with the ones concerning the martial law period uh, because uh, to Poland, uh, telegrams from uh, cables from other uh, missions uh, in Europe and from Moscow. Uh, were in Poland, and uh, a cable by uh, Ambassador Matlock dating back to 1987, uh, quite an extensive one, in which he, uh, he claims that, uh, that this imperial clinch of uh, the USSR is weakened because of social, technological and economic uh, reasons, and, ma uh, and he suggests that it should be um, used uh, by uh, attracting uh, uh, Eastern Bloc countries uh, and make them move away from the USSR. And, uh, um, uh, on the initiative of uh, Whitehead, this cable was sent uh, uh, to all missions uh, uh, across Europe. So this is how it reached uh, Jaruzelski's de uh, desk in translation, obviously. Uh, uh, he also saw a cable from Paris in which U.S. Embassy to France uh, uh, discusses uh, the talks of uh, Whitehead uh, and uh, French officials. So Whitehead explains uh, the, the, the status of negotiations with Poles that Jaruzelski is uh, leaning towards uh, the American requirements and his policy is becoming more conciliatory. And Jaruzelski received uh, this uh, cable uh, uh, two days before Whitehead's uh, visit. So he changes his tone uh, 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 when meeting Whitehead uh, in order to improve his negotiation, negotiation Extent. Uh, so these cables could uh, be used for uh, various reasons uh, because uh, they um, included various information. That I'm the only thing uh, holding you guys back from lunch and probably a bathroom break. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, do you want me to? Do you, is the question related to anything that? Okay. Do you want to ask it and then I'll put it together? Okay. A microphone, please. The understanding was that U.S. sanctions after martial law were revocable from the beginning. My understanding is that they were forced on us by our West European allies, and they did not become revo revocable uh, on the three conditions that we've talked about and, until the NATO meeting, the special meeting in January of 1982. That's one point. The second point is, uh, I think you said that since the 1950s, our policy had been under the differentiation policy toward Eastern Europe. Our policy had been to reward Poles for distancing from the Soviet Union. My understanding was that you rewarded the Poles for political liberalization, which was the other, other wing of the differentiation policy. You rewarded Romania <laughs> for, for uh, uh, departing from closeness to the Soviet Union, but what, uh, we did not ex expect that of Poles. We were hoping it would happen, but the reward was for liberalization. And uh, I think, well, oh, and finally, uh, uh, Valence's memo supporting the lifting of sanctions, uh, he was answering a question from John Davis. So it was, it was a memo that was kind of inspired uh, uh, from within the U.S. Uh, government. I don't, 
I'm not ashamed of that. It was certainly very helpful. <laughs> it was certainly very helpful, but it was not volunteered. Uh, finally, just to restore a sense of, of miracle, Bronislaw Geremek, I remember meeting with him in Washington. I, it was certainly after the round table, but I think it probably had to be after the elections, which we're celebrating today. And he, he looked around and said with a smile, six months ago, what we talked about was what are the best prisons? And now we're talking about forming a government. Thank you. Uh, let me be very brief. There was a couple of questions that were sort of directed my way. Um, one was not directed my way, but I'll comment. Dr. Plishkot referred to an e increase in RFE's broadcast hours. You may be right, but I don't remember it. We were already on the air in the Polish service 20 to 21 hours a day, and I don't recall in that period any increase. You may be right. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about these panels is I learned things from people who had a different angle than I, than I had. Uh, second, uh, Dr. Domber uh, mentioned, uh, asked the question of CIA be money being funneled through Radio for Europe. No, not through Radio for Europe, just through Munich. And, and oh, through Munich's possible. Through, you know, I, I learned only later after I lived there that there was a CIA base there. I never knew it about it until I learned about it much later. It may have gone through the CIA base, but certainly nothing came through. In fact, Radio for Europe has really hands off to CIA in the time I was there. And finally, uh, very briefly, on the, on the president's visit in 1989, since I was the one to organize the, the visit, there was three elements that were important to us in, in no particular, or, well, in reverse political order. One was to make nice to Jaruzelski because he was seen as essential. Uh, two was to, the speech to the same, which was really critical for us. And third and most important was the visit to Gdańsk. Both the private luncheon with Wawensa and the speech to the, the shipyard, those were the things we wanted. And uh, to, to our view, they succeeded. But other people have a different perception of that visit, and I think you, you do, which is fine. OK, thank you. Um, again, I'll try, to, I'll try to be quick here. On the, 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 the issue of revocable sanctions, uh, I think that's in, I think that's in the f one of the first two speeches that Reagan gives. He mentions that yes, we can we can we can roll these back, and he even talks about post World War II American leadership, not mentioning Marshall Plan, but makes a vague reference. And I don't know who wrote those speeches. I haven't looked at the speech files, but I think it's in implicit, not explicit, in those in those in the one of the two first speeches, and. Um, I think it, it also then gets strengthened when the NAC gets really mad at the United States for pushing sanctions on the Soviets in addition to the Poles. Uh, but I think, I think it was in the speeches. I stand corrected. Okay, I'm not, I'd have to look back at the speeches to make sure. Um, but uh, the, the, other, the other issues, are, uh, the other comments are, are, are well taken. I'm, I, I, Totally appreciate that the RFE was not itself involved in the CIA money. I thought there might be some conversation, but it also makes sense that this was distanced. Like, John Davis made sure that everybody in the embassy was also distanced from the CIA and that you would never have a solidarity leader meeting with anybody who could be connected to the CIA. He, that's the last thing he wanted, right? So it was all very distant. Um, questions about the exchange program. So I'm now currently working on exchange programs from the 50s to the 1980s and trying to see what kind of effect it had on the roundtable process. There were 567 people, Poles, who were involved in the roundtable process. 10% of them had gone on official US exchanges. This doesn't mean private exchanges. This is official exchanges. Um, but interestingly, half of them stayed on the government side and half of them were on the opposition side. So clearly, it does not change your individual nature. And there are people who are deeply affected by these, by these exchanges. There are others who say, America was a mess. I didn't want to be like America. And it might have changed a little bit on the sides, on the, on the edges, what they were open to. And then there were some that I talked to who totally reject that thesis, that being in America changed their attitudes at all. I think, like the question of what percentage America is important, again, it's on the edges. But a lot of the reformers who come back into vogue in the 1980s 
had been on these exchanges in the 1960s. And I think Kubiak was on a, um, a Ford Foundation, and that was the one they always said was a CIA one, because it was, in fact, the Ford Foundation was getting CIA money at that point for the Free Europe Committee stuff. And so they always made that connection. Um, but the, the real causality there is a, is a big question, and I haven't, haven't teased out any, any full answer. I do think those exchanges were really important because it provided a group of individuals who had close contacts with the American Embassy in Warsaw and, and created what, um, what Fritz called last night when we were talking about a latent network, right? This network of individuals they knew that they could turn to for information that, that was really important, I think, in terms of what Davis was, was trying to do. In terms of who Davis was talking to in that matchbook conversation about how to vote for Yaroslavsky as president, um, he always said who he was meeting with in his cables. And this one, he begins with the phrase something like, uh, last night I met with a bunch of solidarity advisors who better remain nameless. He recognized that he was going well beyond what he was supposed to do as an ambassador. I asked him about it years later, multiple times. He would still not tell me. He was the consummate, he was a, he was a good diplomat. And, but I assume it was a Gremek, and I'm not sure who else. I've always assumed Gremek, um, I think I, I think I asked Garemek and he was a little cagey about it, um, but I don't remember actually that part of my conversation with him. Um, but the thing was, I think what's necessary about that, what's important about that, is that there was so much trust at that point that they could talk actual tactics. And I think Poles understood democracy. They would have known about head counting on their own. I don't think it was causal, but that level of of trust and the fact that Davis knew he was going too far, he wasn't supposed to do this as a diplomat, and yet did it, right, showed just how much, how comfortable they were with each other. Um, and then it is fascinating, that's exactly how the voting goes, right? Um, and then finally on this issue of $10 billion. I don't know, maybe, maybe in, the, in the economic plans that the opposition was coming up with in 87, 88, that you were part of, if that $10 billion number came from there, I'm not sure. What's fascinating is that, uh, again, Fritz reminded me of this last night, Gates put out, puts out a memo, um, uh, Robert Gates, working at the CIA at the time, puts out a memo in uh, December of 81, it might be what it, you were talking about, about a large amount of money to Poland to try to push liberalization further. Um, 2.5 billion, I think, is the number that you referenced and I think you referenced as well. And then there's, there's also the State Department talks about really big carrots in early 1982 as well. Um, your predecessor's department, De Deputy Assistant Secretary, I think was part of that. Uh, I can't remember if it was Hormouts, I forget who it was. Um, but what's really important to remember that all of those ideas, those were internal to specific agencies and they never went through any interagency process, right? Any bold experiment would have to go through an interagency process and big money to Poland would have died in that interagency process, right? It was, it was a few people in Department of State, maybe somebody in CIA talked about it, but it never got to the level of coordination. And the level of coordination is where all good ideas go to die or get changed into, into something different, right? Um, that's a joke, that's not really how it works, but interagency is much harder to get through. It is, though. It is, okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, but I don't, I don't know where that $10 billion number came from, it was, it was used regularly. Onishkevich talks about it in, in November of 88, December of 88, when he comes to visit. Um, I think, did, yeah, please, please. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. I uh, just have a uh, I had a, a short remark before lunch, so I'm referring to what was said by Professor Pleskot. Um, at the beginning, Jaruzelski tried to confront American propaganda or to counter American propaganda by airing a um, series about American spies in Poland. This was followed by Urban's um, press conferences, who uh, sort of engaged in these confrontations for his internal 
global audience. I remember that he once accused Karamek of being a spy, so he went quite far. There was a moment when, during a discussion on American aid to Poland, he said, there are no homeless people in Poland like there are in the States, and therefore Poland has decided to send uh, 5,000 sleeping bags to New York for the homeless. Um, and there was even a press ad, a story of a press ad. I will exchange a two-room apartment in Ursynów in Warsaw for a uh, sleeping bag in New York. All right. So we are like 10 minutes uh, after the scheduled deadline. However, we started 10 minutes later, so we can say that we kept the time frame. Uh, dear guests, uh, I would like to thank you all our panelists and let's go for a lunch break. We've got one hour. Thank you very much. Thank you.